I'll probably go a little further back into the very beginnings of Snoeta and talk about the principles and uh, the reason for founding the company and how we would actually look into the future and how the development slowly through the projects, through our collaborative methods, uh, through the way we deal with things um, actually are where we are today and then show some examples of types of architecture on the drawing board, some uh, under construction, uh, some finished. Uh, so yeah, it, it's kind of a fairly broad so I hope I'll manage in 40 minutes, but you know, architecture is su such a slow profession, so usually it doesn't work to uh, talk uh, short about architecture, but uh, you know, it'll be working out somehow. It really is very great to be, be here. Um, I was totally impressed, in fact, by the film. Did we actually say all that? Uh, uh, I, I, I feel somehow, um, having to do this lecture now and everything's already said. But uh, at the same time, of course, maybe we can attach this to some of the projects in a similar way and try to underline maybe some of the few other things that we're actually dealing with. So, Ananes, eco-philosopher, a uh, Norwegian one, was once asked, when did you start climbing? Because he was a mountain climber. And he said, I never stopped. And you know, this is kind of an important uh, way of looking at things because we're carrying with us these deep emotions as children, trying to achieve certain aspects of our lives, try to shape it, try to put it together in a way that feels good to us. Where we believe that we can do that in collaboration, you can build uh, at, at the age of 10, a small cabin with your friends, and all of a sudden, you can go inside this kind of little space that you've built, and you can be there with your friends. So uh, this actually is me on the way up to Snöheta, uh, climbing. Uh, it is almost, you can't get much closer to the mountain than climbing. It's almost like having sex with the mountain. I have to, but it, it makes a point, it makes a point because we are depending on extreme intimacy between our surroundings and ourselves in order to understand them. And that means that architecture never, never, is about the brain, singularly, or about the stomach. It's about the whole body. And architecture is being produced, don't forget, in the minds of people. And that's why it's also mainly for people. There is no such thing as architecture for the sake of architecture. Again, you might be interested in why it's possible to take a document like this and try to establish uh, a practice, an architectural and landscape architectural practice uh, related to a report coming out of the UN. Well, we grew up, partially at least, in the Nordic countries. You were sort of fed this kind of thing uh, at school and you say, okay, how do I translate physically something that is actually meant as a political document into architecture, landscape architecture? How do you bring that? How do you redefine the elements of how you deal with it? So the Brundtland report was extremely important because, as I said already in the film, it dealt with social, environmental, and economical sustainability for the first time. And now, this report was the basis for the global goals and uh, everything on the table at COP27 now in Egypt was based on this report. Now, we started, as I said, on the social side of this report. It was the more obvious, uh, it was more latent. We felt that, and still do to a large extent, that social sustainability is the mother of all sustainabilities. If you don't have a stable political system, probably shouldn't say that here, uh, uh, we have a long-term education. You have equality between genders. You have equality in society. How should you ever become conscious about the environmental and economical aspects implied in the report? So we have to build societies that are socially stable and sustainable long-term in order to get to the point of economical and uh, environmental sustainability. Now, 
it's obvious that this is for the rich countries to do. I, I will say this directly to all the Norwegian listeners. I'm kind of embarrassed that we're still pumping up oil and, and pushing the gas price up. But what can I say? We are in a position to do that. And if we don't, from rich countries around the world, now take the responsibility on where we go, we're going to fail long term. The world will manage, the plants will manage, the fish will manage, but we will not manage. And that is getting more and more pertinent. It's getting more and more critical as we speak. Today and tomorrow, there are two different worlds. We are tomorrow building much more than what we're building today ever in history. And yesterday, we were building more than the day before. 40% of CO2 emissions and equivalents are being released through the building industry. I You've seen these pictures already in the film, but you know this is uh, Craig here. He uh, is running the office in uh, New York mainly. Uh, Elaine, his wife, is there. Jorun is not there. I think you were in Mexico at the time, right? Um, and this was actually the first trip uh, to the top of Snöet, that this little group of people trying to sort of understand their lives. And you have to remember we were in a position around 29, 30 years old, uh, just having won uh, the <laughs> Library of Alexandria, which then, of course, took 12 years to complete. Uh, architecture is a slow profession. You have to be really patient. Uh, nothing works the way you think. Uh, everything goes wrong. And then you rectify it, you change it, and it moves forward. So as I said, social sustainability. Why, why is that? What's so funny? Yet I'll talk to you about this afterwards. Um, so the library in Alexandria is basically a way of portraying, let's say, a different contour line of uh, a uh, harbor city. So the verticals and horizontals that you see in here is broken by this large curve. Sometimes we've compared it to ice skating, where you, know, you have to push your outer leg over in order to have a perfect curve. But of course, the library in Alexandria was one of the first and most driving uh, projects for us. It was a broad collaboration between people from different countries already at the time, Austria, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the US, uh, LA. You were in, uh, my wife, an artist, had been in Mexico and came to LA. We rented everything in an apartment in Los Angeles for a period of five weeks. That's where we did the competition. And we were sleeping under the tables. We rented everything there uh, out of the film industry. Uh, so even the tables, the pencils, the rubbers, uh, and we rented a video machine with only one video, and the video was the fly. You know, you've seen this when the guy gets into the time machine and becomes half fly, half human. Uh, so all of this happened during the development of this project. And when it was finished, and when people started using it, we saw de facto that by having changed the program slightly, because at the beginning it was intended to be lots of small library rooms, by creating this large space that happened inside there, we, we could actually get people in in a different way. It opened the space differently. And of course, uh, with you in there as an artist, developing this stone wall, granite, we're bringing back the handcrafting and the actual touch of art onto this granite wall, five and a half thousand square meters large, hand engraved by 20 young Egyptians over a period of two and a half years. So getting in contact again with the profession, we opened a quarry, a separate quarry on the border of Sudan. We got all the equipment in. Uh, we opened the quarry again to split the stone correctly, and we had these people deal with this. And slowly, slowly, it of course became a building that in the end was protected by the inhabitants of Alexandria during the Arabic Spring. Now, to me, that is probably, let's call it the most heartwarming moment of my life so far. That someone is actually 24 seven holding hands around a building you've been part of designing and building to protect it. That can only mean one thing. It means they've made it theirs. Otherwise, they would need to protect it. <coughs> so sometimes 
you ask yourself, what kind of effect does a building have? And we do a lot of post-occupancy studies on different projects just to see and compare. Here, the staff ratio between male and female uh, at the Library of Alexandria compared to Egyptian labor force, US labor force, or global labor force. So you will see already in the establishment and the way the library is laid out, it actually employed more women, also in an Arab country, than almost any other uh, institution we knew of. And if you compared it to the Tal Hussein Library in Cairo, which is the main library, and you look at what happened after uh, the revolution, the spring, then you will see all of a sudden that our memberships for young people and uh, children grew. Okay, there were some years without data, but not only in our case, because you know what happened at that, these two years in Egypt. But still, I think it's necessary to read architecture as a, as a tool, something you want to achieve at the other end. Yes, of course, it should be beautiful. Yes, of course, it should have other things to do. And in the end, if we don't manage to actually use it the way that society actually can benefit from it, then in a way it's useless. Okay. Secondly, we won uh, the Opera House in Oslo. And all of a sudden we were a bit more than a one-time wonder. We were a two-time wonder. But it helped us because in 2002 we opened the library in Alexandria and in 2000 we won this competition. And that gave us the possibility to continue and develop not only the architecture but the collaboration with architecture as extended landscape architecture, but also as art. So here, Jürgen, again, became artist for this big roof, and the roof is a piece of art. And it doesn't have to follow building regulations. Art does not have to follow building regulations. Architecture must follow building regulations. So in the end, this kind of refined element of marvel that became this piece of art was not only an aesthetic expression, it was not only the experience of how things were moving, it was not only beautiful, but it also opened up for us to do specific things in architecture that you couldn't do before. So, just before the day of the opening, the building inspectors came and said, here you have a step, here you have a step, here you have a step. You have to have these yellow and black stickers at the corner of these steps. So we were uh, looking around in Europe and we found the stickers with the worst kind of glue. And after three days they were gone and never came back. So again, it's all about art inclusion. Here the textile artist uh, Lovos of Wagle interpreting art back in as part of architecture inclusive or in the main lobby of the Opera House, Olaf Eliasson's work, uh, how that is, as frozen music, interprets a space, brings it back in, in a different way. Or in the main hall, Pay White's stage curtain, which is the most incredibly woven carpet. No silver threads in this weave, and it's flat. And she's woven in the color reflections of the main hall as a part of a frozen picture. It's all about this in the end, right? How do you use something as formally as an opera? How do you actually get to the point that people really break the law in order to be able to use it? So that's how it goes, and you find people uh, interpreting and reinterpreting certain intentions. 
you find people putting associations together and believing that they have it the right way. But that's also a way of finding value within the things that you're not necessarily created yourself. It's a way of looking for solutions to sensitize yourself within the setting you're in, like here also with the tenant field. Again, post-occupancy studies. An increase in attendance after the opening, you can see here much more people visiting, but not only, and I'm not showing this here, but not only more people coming to the opera, but they dress differently. The age constellation was different. And people moving on the top of the roof for the first time, slowly, slowly found a way to the entrance, and slowly, slowly from the entrance into the main hall. And then the public changed. And that, of course, helped, because then we needed less government funding to actually operate the arts inside. And that gave us the possibility, of course, for a much more long-term and economically sustainable cultural uh, institution. Another really important project for us was the Memorial, uh, Grand Zero Memorial Pavilion. Um, it was the first time that we were in despair looking at the stakeholder groups uh, that we had to relate to. We could have had a room up to 500 people with, you know, uh, Republicans, Democrats, Muslims, Jews, Christian, Catholics, uh, policemen, firemen, and nobody could agree. Nobody would ever try even to find a way forward. And that's the first time we introduced the term negotiated architecture. We had about 14 or 15 different designs before finally we could land something carefully where everyone would agree and say, okay, not necessarily even agree, but say, okay, we'll go with it. We'll do it. And that's how this building came about. And today, you know, you will see that it's maybe not challenging that much as it could do, but it is a place for people to enter into the museum. It is a place for remembering. And the family room is still connected to this building. And the family room at World Trade Center is a very, very emotional place because it's where all the family members of um, those who lost people during the attack are sending uh, pictures, are sending gifts, and it's all collected in this family room. So it's very emotional. And of course, again, I hide what you're looking down at, where you're looking in looking at that. So where has this led us in 2022? You heard a bit of it uh, already in the film. Um, it's even a little more uh, than that. We are actually already today uh, nine studios, 14 nationalities and 350 employees. And the location of these places is San Francisco, New York, Oslo, Paris, Innsbruck, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Adelaide and Melbourne, which means that we have across collaboration between continents, people, and professions at the same time. Because still, we've expanded from architecture and landscape to interior, art, graphic, digital, and product design. Which also means that we can follow up on our transpositional idea making, which is all about bringing specialists around the table and ask them to leave their profession. Because I'm really interested in the musician and the engineer because the engineer I'm getting for free in any case is always inside the engineer. I want the architect in the psychologist, or I would really love to have the landscape architect in the artist. So all these things come together in a different way. It's a little like uh, orchestra, uh, orchestras rehearsing on each other's instruments. But of course, when there is a concert, you go back to your initial way of performing with your specialized instrument. So during production, everyone goes back to their profession. But the creative part, we think of the concepts, we get the ideas, that's when you cross collaborate totally differently. So right now we have 14 building sites, 300 projects approximately in 40 different countries. So singular in the plural, what does that mean? I mentioned it in the film, but let me take it one step further. It's a philosophical term where some of the things that we're dealing with is all about how you see yourself in a larger context. For instance, when I'm asked what is 
SNOW had this most important project, the answer would always be SNOW HETA is our most important project. Simply because it's dealing with people in that context for them to understand to contribute to the collectiveness of things. And this happens continuously by training, by having people meet up. So every second year, we take about as many of the employees as we can, and we take the tour up to the top of Snerta. Right? You can't imagine how satisfying it is for someone who doesn't normally walk in nature to actually get to the peak of this thing, to the top of the mountain, and get back down again. Even if you don't get all the way to the top, it's a huge achievement. And this satisfaction of having actually gone through nature on the way up and down again is then directly reflected back into the designs that they're doing when they get back to New York or Sydney. So it's a little like Laurie Anderson said, uh, walking is preventing yourself from falling forward slightly. So it's, again, all to do with gravity, forces, and the way you look at your own body and location. So that leads me to out of prepositions. I have to do this a little bit more because it's so important that you understand and maybe disagree, but at least understand what I mean, is that <coughs> nature provides us with prepositions in order to locate ourselves and to communicate to others our location. You would yell out, I'm in front of the mountain. I'm not behind the mountain, so where am I? I'm by the fjord. I'm not on the fjord. It's, it's a matter of location and communication, but it's also a way of protection against things that might happen. So prepositions are sort of deeply embedded in languages, in the way we talk about nature and how we locate nature in our own setting. And that starts very, very early. This kind of communicative, silent transmittal of understanding of an object by touching, playing, sitting, skiing, beautiful skiing. But we're not alone. You know, it doesn't come from us. Uh, yesterday I was also in an exhibition by Günther Domenic in Graz. Even he was influenced by Paul Virilio. Jean Noël, everyone's influenced by Paul Virilio. He's one of the best, really, writers. And he talks about oblique architecture during the 60s. Why does he do that? Because, as we, he believes that the way we react when we walk on a surface is to do with the forces and the distribution of forces through the body onto the ground. It's hard to walk up, easy to walk down. So all these things come together in this description, and we try to do this, of course, through different reaction patterns at Times Square, uh, or here with the new opera house in Busan in Korea, which is on its way, or the new opera house in uh, Shanghai, or with the Ordre de Gore in Copenhagen, which is a small museum, probably the first extension of a Zaha did building, I would say, and we had this conversation, and we said, okay, I don't think we can extend your building. <laughs> you know, Zaha's, I mean, where would you start? Uh, Zaha can extend a building like this, but how do you extend a Zaha did building? So that's why we designed a building which is only this high, this tall. It's not really a building. It's just an underground space. And again, back to prepositions and how you deal with these spaces. Similar to our Lascaux project for the caves in Lascaux, the, the section through the landscape is uh, divided between the forest and the, the uh, agricultural land, and all of a sudden you create these slot spaces, in between spaces, before you get into the caves. But first you have to scan the caves, because today you cannot walk into the original cave. Just by breathing you will ruin the paint, and in five years you know all the wall paintings will be gone. So we scanned down to absolute precision the whole cave. Then a lot of young artists kept painting for a period of two and a half years to reproduce the interior perspective of these caves. Every painting, every layer. And we were afraid by sending children into this cave that they would think, my god, I've been to the cave been to the real cave in Lascaux. No, you haven't. You've been inside a contemporary artifact which looks like the cave. So 
So when you come out again on the other side, we show everyone who's been through the cave exactly how it's built. Exactly how it's built up, so we never ever confuse it with the real cave. Form follows environment is something we've said for a long time. Uh, I won't go too deep, but we had a wakening up when we were working with an electrical car company in Norway. I can assure you, it is so much fun to drive a car inside an air bubble. And you can do it without dying. It is really a huge difference. And of course, in early times, it wasn't only about the, uh, the, the emissions that came out of the car, but it was really also about how you can relate to the materials that you use, the air you breathe. And slowly, slowly, that developed into the environmental strategies that we've been following since then. But it could also be related to handicraft and representing of small things like getting your own trees for a tiny little building or finding someone who can still work the axe in order to create uh, the cladding, the wood cladding of a small cabin. But these beautiful ways of actually closing down the surface of the wood and getting, uh, all, letting all the oil stay inside the, uh, the wood and extending the lifespan by that, but also not cutting away all the amount of wood that you would normally do with the saw. So right now, we have so many completed projects, like here, Living the Nordic Light with Sumtober, interviewing four people over 100 years old, living all their lives north of the polar circle, and doing some research at the same time. So it turns out, in fact, that if you're born north of the polar circle, you can see more blue tones than if you're born south of the polar circle. That means people north of the polar circle have simply, through the blue hour, developed sensitivities that are relating to a larger variation of blue. But they have maintained the green and the yellow. Or here, Asi in Innsbruck, overgrown building, looking at wood structure and natural ventilation. Maybe not completely negative yet, but moving in the right direction. Or here, student center, Ryerson in Toronto, where the students can actually refurbish their student learning center every semester. Uh, it belongs to them. Everyone has a key. This is the beach. Or here, uh, Ryerson. Did I say Ryerson for the other? No. 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 Yeah, OK. So uh, this is Ryerson, library belonging to the public, moving in, all these type of things. San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, where we have mainly stairs for people to walk. Uh, we've hidden the lifts. And then we get a contribution from uh, the American health authorities. Or play, play, like a play tower for Swarovski, all about activities, production lines, where you know, the factory becomes your cultural building. OK, they pro you produce the glass crystals in this space. But at the same time, it's a place where all of a sudden you have a poetry reading or you have a performance. There shouldn't be any difference. Or here, the Le Monde building interpretation of an article that happened after the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris, when all the Charlie Hebdo, um, all the Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, employees actually moved into the Le Monde building. We took this article, we pixelated it, and projected it back on the facade. Or King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture in Saudi Arabia. First common entrance for men and women, first public cinema. Uh, how can you change things? How can architecture become that platform, that way of actually changing certain societies into something else? How can you portray 3,000 years of building history by combining these stainless steel pipes together with the rammed earth in one detail? And how can you react to landscapes and 
how these things happen at some point in the future when we learn to walk on water. Thank you.